Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. It's me, EDJ here. You'll notice the setup's a little different. I, my mom moved my um my room around, so, yay. I, I don't know. I kind of like it, but overall, welcome back. We're gonna be reacting to another oversimplified video, another two-parter about the Cold War. Now, I, I like to give my little knowledge spill about what I know. The Cold War is an event that I believe. Don't quote me on this, but I believe it lasted. 50 years or around that and it was a well it's not it was a battle of ideology i between the ussr soviet russia and the united states of america between communism and capitalism and it started shortly or after world war ii and the thing is i believe it's because of the of nukes being around there wasn't a direct battle between uh the two the two states because that probably would have i'm um, not states sorry Blech. i want to apologize it's getting hot here and i'm like eh. but point is um yeah there wasn't a direct battle between the two superpowers because that would have probably ended the entire world especially with all the nukes going around so it became more of like a a chess match? I kind of like to imagine this conflict as a chess match. I say that because there's a lot of proxy wars, basically, like, for example, the Korean War. You know, Soviet Russia funded the North, and the United States fun funded the South, and conflicts like this waged around the world with each, uh, with each side funding in order to stop or spread communism, so... Yeah, overall, a very interesting conflict that just weighed for quite a while. And over I, I hope I got the majority of that right, but anything I didn't get right, where I'm about to relearn through Oversimplified. It's been a while, it's been... I haven't learned this stuff since sophomore year, so I'm, I'm, ha I'm excited to see what I get right or what I don't get right. And... Yeah, that's really all I've got. Before I get started, I want to give credit to Oversimplified. I don't know in this video. This is all his work. I'm just a dude who likes history. And um, I'm just wanting to learn more about it. So, yeah. Without any further ado, let's just get right into it. Let's watch Oversimplified's The Cold War Part Uno. Description down below. The year is 1917. Fighting rages on the Eastern Front of the First World War. Both Germany hmm. and Russia are on the brink of collapse. Soldier, I need okay, to Okay, click on the right man. video. <laughs> Got it. Found him, sir. Oh my gosh. No, not Lenin. Lenin, the Russian communist. What? Why would I need a beetle? Lenin, the Russian communist. He was exiled to Switzerland. You know what? I'll do it myself. I remember this. Who wants to start a revolution? <laughs> the Germans put Lenin on a train and sent him all the way back to Russia, hoping he and his mates would create an internal crisis. And create an internal crisis they did. The government was overthrown, and Lenin was in charge. He immediately pulled out of the First World War, made the country communist. Okay, so I just want to say something. Yeah, I, I always tend to forget, I think a lot of people do, that I guess you yeah, had the Germans send Lenin back. Man, I'm, I'm wondering if, like, if they hadn't done that, if, like, Lenin would have ever gone back on his own, or he would have remained in exile. And... Maybe it would have, but I don't know. It's an interesting thought to think, like, maybe he wouldn't, and uh, every, the whole communist Soviet Union could have been avoided just because the, the Germans didn't send him back. I don't know, that, that's, a, that's a funny thought to think about that. Started a three-year-long civil war, got shot, broke the economy, caused a famine, and then he died. On his deathbed, he said... <laughs> yeah, when you put it like that, he, he, he didn't do a great job. Don't let that jerk Stalin become the next leader. By the way, who did I put in charge of giving people jobs? That would be Stalin, sir. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Stalin was a rising force in the Communist Party. He still had some opponents, but conveniently, all of them were arrested or disappeared. So that was lucky. And so... 
Stalin took over. He implemented I found my lamp. Plans, which transformed the country from an agriculture based economy to an industrial one. And like Lenin before him, he reigned with terror. Anyone who dared criticize or oppose him would either be killed or left to rot in the horrendous Soviet work camps. Then a short man the with gulags. a silver mustache tried to take over the world, punched the Russians all the way to Moscow, and then the Russians, with some help from their faithful ally, the Winter, punched them all Kicked the way back to Berlin. Back, yes. At this point, being allies, America, the UK, and the Soviet Union were good chums. They held a couple of conferences near the end of the war to decide what would happen next. <laughs> Such a surreal photo. I don't know why. It's just so weird to see Stalin just like with other leaders and just. I guess they were being cordial enough, but. Yeah, it's weird. Hey Stalin, after all your trials and tribulation, you must be pretty happy to be standing here in Berlin. Tsar Alexander made it all the way to Paris. Uh. <laughs> hey, uh. J just give me a second. Hey man. I think something's up with Stalin. I know, right? What should we do? Shall I tell him about the bomb? Yeah, tell him about the bomb. That will scare him. So, we got this crazy new big A-bomb that can destroy an entire city in one go. Yes, my spies told me already. Oh wait, I meant to act surprised. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> he already knew. How? Um... Am I sure I want to send nuclear secrets by unsecured public coffee shop wife? Man, I hate it when that happens, it. dude. Dude, use a VPN. And speaking of VPNs, if does the A stand for atomic or ass? Then America dropped the <laughs> bomb on Japan, and World War II officially came to an end. Hooray, we won! Okay, so now it's time to establish the new world order. Stalin, you're in charge of Eastern Europe. Now, we want you to let them all hold elections. Oh yes, of course, elections. And these elections will be free and fair, right? Oh yes, certainly, free and no. fair. No. Definitely free and fair. <laughs> communist, 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 communist. Oh yeah, this is the Iron Curtain, I believe. I think it was because Stalin was uh, worried about, like, I guess, non-communist states imposing their will or, like, surrounding him. So I think in his paranoia, he made a bunch of communist satellite states to, um, I guess, as a buffer zone between him and the rest of the world. So, yeah, I believe that's... The Iron Curtain. If that's not free and fair, I don't know what is. Throughout Eastern Europe, <laughs> Soviet puppet governments were established as a buffer zone between the USSR and the West, with Churchill proclaiming <laughs> an Iron Curtain had descended across the continent. The relationship okay, I got it right. the old allies was deteriorating fast. Over the next few years, the British intervened in the Greek Civil War to prevent a communist takeover. In Turkey, the Russians began demanding more control of Turkey's sea axis routes, which prompted the US to send their largest battleship to Turkey for a friendly visit. After World War II, Dang. Iran was now occupied by both the Soviets and the British, with an agreement to both pull out once the war was over. The British pulled out. Stalin was like, you know what? I think I might stick around. All in favor of kicking Russia out of Iran? You want to know something? You guys suck. Pressure from the UN forced <laughs> the Soviets to leave. And with the establishment of NATO, the Soviets had no doubt that the West was out to encircle and destroy them. And America announced the Truman Doctrine, in which they basically said, those guys are not cool, cannot be trusted, and we will do everything we can to prevent the spread of communism around the world. Many view this moment mm -hmm. as the official declaration of the Cold War. Hear that? <laughs> Laughter means your donations are making an impact. Back in Europe, everyone was living in a post-apocalyptic void brought on by the Second World War. Cities reduced to rubble, not enough food, it was terrible. This is great. The more they suffered, the more likely it is they'll turn to <laughs> food. You're really messed up. What's wrong with you? Yeah. My father used to punish me severely. America realized what was going You know, a lot of awful people, from serial killers to, uh, like, people like Stalin, I noticed a trend is that a lot of them just had really awful childhoods, really bad parents. Now, not obviously not every single bad person has just had a bad parent or parents. Sometimes people, for some reason, just end up wrong. Maybe they may even be in the perfect home environment and still end up bad. Um, but I just noticed that a lot of them have bad, abusive upbringings. And, I don't know, that kind of... I always think that maybe, like, would have a lot of these people ended up as awful as they did if they have had, like, good parents, a, a good childhood... I don't know if that's everything, but I do believe that plays a, a large part in how a lot of people end up bad, so, I don't know.
I don't know, I don't know why that thought came in my head, I was just thinking about it. ...going on, and quickly made a move. Under the Marshall Plan, they sent $12 billion to Western Europe for its economic recovery. The countries of Stalin's Eastern Bloc looked on with envy. Hey, Czechoslovakia, <laughs> you want to come get some economic aid? Yeah, but I have to check with my mom first. <laughs> Sorry, America. I can't come. This was a full-on economic battle raging between capitalism and communism in Europe. If the Western nations developed faster and better than the East, that would be a defeat for Stalin. So he set up his own rival economic recovery plan, which he called Comic-Con, and he also set up Common Oh, Corps, seriously? <laughs> political control over the Eastern Bloc. But nowhere did this economic battle rage harder than in the city of Berlin. Caught over a hundred miles behind Soviet lines, the city had been divided up between the Allies, and the Western segments were still under Western control. East Berliners could travel freely to West Berlin, see the economic prosperity, and think, hmm, maybe this communism thing ain't so great after all. I'm gonna have fun tonight. <laughs> You're home late. Oh, Stalin. I was just out with my friends. Friends? You stink of capitalism! You're out engaging in imperialist debauchery again! I swear, Ivan, I can't keep doing this. Stalin wanted the West <laughs> out, so he said, Dang. Hey, guess what? I'm blockading all of your supply routes to West Berlin. What are you gonna do about it? I suppose we'll just fly the supplies in. Oh yeah, I remember the airlift thing. Gosh darn it, my light went out. Truman, you in this round. The Berlin airlift was an incredible undertaking and a major success for the Western Allies. And Stalin ended his blockade of West Berlin. His aggressive actions worried the West, but not as much as this did. Oh yeah, they developed their own bomb. The Soviet Union had developed their very own atomic bomb. The USA no longer had a nuclear monopoly. The world now knew that if a major war broke out between the two superpowers, it everyone's would be more destructive dead. than anyone <laughs> could imagine. So it was comforting when Stalin came out and said that war between the Soviet Union and the West was unlikely. No, he said inevitable. inevitable. He said it was inevitable. Yes. Hey, you know who I haven't checked in on in a while? Sorry, My good it's dumb friend, China. Whoa, what happened to you? <laughs> What happened to them was a full-blown civil war that had been going on since 1927. The People's Liberation Army, under the leadership of Mao Zedong, successfully defeated the Republic of China, who fled mm -hmm. to Taiwan. The now communist China and the Soviet Union signed a mutual defense treaty. This was terrible news for the West. But wait, there's more. After the Second World War, Korea was divided along the 38th parallel. In the North, the Soviets set up a communist regime. In the South, America set up an anti-communist regime. Both were led by very sweet-looking old men. But don't let that deceive you. They were both ruthless dictators, and both mm -hmm. dreamed of reuniting Korea under their own regime. Now that he had the bomb, Stalin was feeling a little more cocky, and he finally gave Kim permission to attack. The North launched a surprise invasion of the South on June 25th, 1950. With Soviet aid, the North Koreans steamrolled through, taking Seoul in just three days and replacing one ruthless dictator with another. The UN were peeking out. <laughs> I like how he's just a giant head. Force made up of troops from 16 countries to defend the South. The West still held Busan and made landings at Incheon near Seoul. They pushed the North Koreans out of Seoul, replacing the ruthless dictator that had replaced the first ruthless dictator with the same ruthless dictator that had previously been replaced by the new ruthless oh, dictator. Boy, yeah. And the West then continued all the way up the Korean Peninsula. At this point, China was getting worried that the UN may just keep going. The US had sent this guy to lead the operation. After winning mm -hmm. the Pacific Theater of World War II, General Douglas MacArthur's head was big and his balls were bigger. He reassured President Truman that there was absolutely no way at all that the Chinese would ever get involved. Meanwhile, half a million Chinese- Yeah, there's a- there's a great Korean movie about the Korean War. Um, give me a sec. Okay, I found it. So there's this Korean War movie, I believe the translation, it's from 2004, it's called The Brotherhood of War. I'm not even gonna try to pronounce that, guys. I think you all thank me for not butchering the the language, but um, yeah, it's a great movie about two brothers and the events of the of the Korean War that in that happened around them, and it's a really great movie, and I'd recommend it if you want like a great historical movie about the Korean War. Very emotional. I remember seeing it when we were learning about this back in my sophomore year. And um, I believe you mentioned that, yeah, the, the Chinese didn't get involved. No, they got involved. And I think MacArthur wanted to nuke them. He was like, we have to nuke, use it. And I think it's good that he didn't get his way. Honestly, with the Cold War, I feel like I, we could say that for multiple points. It's good that the people who wanted war and to use the nukes didn't get their way because... The world as we know it probably wouldn't be as we know it. troops were crossing into Korea. Nukem. No. Nukem. 
No, <laughs> come on, you're fired. The U.S. considered the nuclear option, but now that the Soviets also had the bomb, they didn't want to risk all-out global destruction. The communists pushed the West right back almost to the exact same spot they had all started from, and they ended up in a stalemate where they remained until both sides finally agreed to work towards a peace settlement in 20... Protecting nature begins with you. Defend oh, the natural bears. world you love by donating to the nature... 2018. Back in America, <laughs> Americans decided they wanted a new president who would be tough on communism. So they elected famed World War II general Eisenhower, who is really hard to draw. It's <laughs> 1953. Hey, Stalin. How you doing? Oh, he's dead. He had a cerebral hemorrhage and his reign of terror kind of came back to bite him in the ass because he had imprisoned all of his best doctors and those that were left were too terrified to treat him. The new leader, Nikita Khrushchev, mm. called a meeting and said, Hey guys, you know how Stalin was imprisoning and murdering us all for doing basically nothing? Yeah, he was kind of a jerk. Yeah, de-Stalinization, I believe, was uh, the move. I'm really not sure how this is news to you. Khrushchev went <laughs> on a campaign of de-Stalinization. Statues yes. of Stalin were taken down, Stalingrad was renamed, and Khrushchev announced that he wanted the Soviet people to be happy and would allow greater freedom in the Soviet Union. So how did that work out? Well, an uprising in East Germany was brutally suppressed, a revolution in Hungary was brutally suppressed, and demonstrations in Poland were brutally suppressed although he did finally allow some mild reforms. Back in the Soviet Union, he permitted more cultural expression, but then began banning stuff based on his own personal taste. Modern art looks like a child urinated on a canvas. Ban. Jazz it's music true. sounds like the feeling of needing to fart. Ban. <laughs> Your poetry is really depressing. How could anyone in the Soviet Union be depressed? You're banned. Khrushchev wanted the Soviet people to be happy, but not like that, or that, or that. Young people began enjoying abhorrent Western pop culture. The Beatles. Son, remove that disgusting imperialist apparel at once. Shut up, Dad. You can't tell me what to do. Well, would you look at that? Turns out <laughs> he can tell me what to do. The West had initially liked the cut of Khrushchev's jib, but world events soon soured relations even more. The two sides were spying on each other a whole lot throughout the Cold War. The KGB had spies and informants in nearly every aspect of Western life and government, so much so that whenever the US tried to send spies into the Soviet Union, the KGB were usually ready to arrest them on the spot. Members of the Manhattan Project aided the Soviet Union in acquiring the bomb. Some American officials believed they were on the wrong side. I'll sell you three secrets for five million dollars. Okay. Go ahead. The Allies are digging a tunnel under East Berlin to tap your communications. There's an American agent living at this address in Moscow, and sometimes Traders. when I'm home alone, I like to put on my wife's dresses, sit in the corner, and cry for hours. <laughs> Very interesting. In America, fear <laughs> during the Red Scare and the McCarthy trials. American oh, values imploded yes. as fear of communism collided with freedom of thought and expression, and communist kind of became a buzzword thrown around to describe anything people didn't like. Hollywood? Communist. Your next door neighbor's dog? Communist. When the grocery <laughs> store cashier asks if you need a bag when you clearly can't carry 10 tubs of bacon A's in your hands, communist. But one area in particular where the US had an edge over the Soviet yeah. Union was in its espionage technology. In particular, U-2 spy planes flew across Russia carrying out surveillance from the skies. There was a nasty incident in 1960 though, when one was shot down and Khrushchev was furious. Who the hell is this? He's a high altitude weather enthusiast who flew off course. Okay, that sounds plausible. Wait a minute, <laughs> why does he have a gun and a poison needle? Because... He's a very naughty high-altitude weather enthusiast. But much to America's concern, very the Soviet naughty. Union appeared to be ahead in the space race. Everyone freaked out when Russia launched the world's first satellite, and then they actually... I believe, yeah, uh, he's about to say it, but I believe uh, Russia sent the first man into space. I think also the first dog... Oh, that poor dog. They sent a man into space. Even worse, there also appeared to be a missile gap in the Soviets' favor, and Khrushchev was so confident that he even allowed the U.S. to set up a technology exhibit in Moscow, attended by a certain vice president, Richard Nixon. Check this <laughs> out. We have colored TVs. A crook. Yes, but we've been to space and can obliterate you with our massive nuclear arsenal. Check out this vegetable peeler. Tensions increased further when both sides upgraded their atomic bombs to hydrogen bombs. And after West oh Germany boy. was allowed to join NATO in 1955, Khrushchev set up the Defensive Warsaw Pact, strengthening the military ties between the Soviet Union and its satellite states. In 1960, Americans decided they wanted a new president who would be tough on communism, so they elected John F. Kennedy. The Soviet Union was advancing its technology, but it was also bleeding its coffers dry, and all of the money was going towards the military, not the people. Life under communism was still as hard as ever, and Berlin remained a thorn in the 
the Soviet side. The contrast between the economically prosperous West and the struggling East was clearer day by day, and East Berliners were still able to freely travel to the West. Now, many of them were deciding to stay there. Millions defected to West Germany via West Berlin, causing Eastern factories to lose workers and taking a heavy toll on the economy. Soviet leaders decided this couldn't continue any longer. First, Khrushchev tried this. Leave West Berlin, or else. Or else what? Or else, I'll be really mad at you. Yeah, no, we're gonna stay. Listen, man, <laughs> West Berlin is ours, East Berlin is yours. That's just how it is. Kennedy felt pretty good about his show of American resolve. But wait a second, did you catch that? Let's replay it. Oh. Uh-oh, Kennedy just told Khrushchev that the USA wouldn't interfere in what the Soviets did with their section of Berlin. So Khrushchev came up with a new idea. We're gonna build a wall, and it's gonna be a big, <laughs> beautiful wall, and it's gonna keep uh, all the 2016. Mexicans. <laughs> 2016 oh, sorry, vibes. Gonna keep in all the Mexicans. On August 13th, 1961, <laughs> Berliners in there, woke up to find their city divided into two, with barbed wire and guards blocking the border between east and west. Over time, a wall was constructed throughout the city. Families were torn apart. Thousands would risk their lives escaping over the wall, and hundreds would die trying. To the despair of Berliners, the West were unable to do anything about it, but the wall did put on full display the failure of the communist system. As Kennedy said, democracy is not perfect, but we have never had to put a wall up to keep our people in. As part of the agreement bars. between the two sides, U.S. diplomats JFK were still allowed bars. to travel to East Berlin. But suddenly, East Berlin crossing guards started giving them the business. And Kennedy was like, nah -uh. In October, the U.S. rolled tanks up to the crossing point at Checkpoint Charlie as a show of strength. The Soviets did the same, and the two were in a standoff. They stayed like that for 16 hours, and the world braced for nuclear Armageddon. Thankfully, though, Kennedy called Khrushchev directly and was like, Hey man, this is getting way too hot. How about you back your tanks up by an inch and we'll do the same? Sounds good. Okay, how about you back your tanks up by another inch and we'll follow suit? <laughs> Alright, hey, you want to do another inch? And they both very slowly inched away from the apocalypse. Phew, let's hope that's the biggest crisis of my presidency. Nope. It wasn't. <laughs> Alright guys, I'll see you in part 2. I'm about to jump to part 2. Bye everyone.